بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب اللهم صل على محمد الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فلما بلغ معه السعي قال يا بني إني أرى في المنام أني أذبحك فانظر ماذا ترى قال يا أبت افعل ما تؤمر ستجدني إن شاء الله من الصابرين. The first of our salawat in honor of Rasul Allah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. The second in honor of Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib. The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa'l-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. The story of the sacrifice of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam is one of the most fascinating stories within the Holy Quran. And indeed, one of the most important stories within the Bible. Over three billion people in the world today honor the sacrifice of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's a sacrifice which is honored by Muslims, Christians, and members of the Jewish community. Although the particulars of the sacrifice may differ between the religions, in that we see within Christianity and Judaism, the sacrifice of Ibrahim was the sacrifice of his son Isaac. Whereas in the religion of Islam, the sacrifice was of his son Ismail. The difference being in the conception of who is seen as being the firstborn to be sacrificed. In the opinion of the religion of Islam, the firstborn of Ibrahim was Ismail. As in it is seen that Ismail was 13 years older than Ishaq. Whereas within the Bible, the idea is given that no, Isaac was the sacrifice. The fact remains that the story of the sacrifice of Prophet Ibrahim provides us ample lessons which are spiritual, as well as ethical, as well as theological. With many Muslims every year in the month of the Hijjah coming together to honor that particular sacrifice in the land of Mecca. You find that the story itself is one of a number of stories in the Quran which opens up the discussion concerning our attachment and our responsibility with our children. Because you find Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, when Allah narrates the story, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us that each and every Prophet had a certain attachment to their sons or a certain attachment to their daughters. You find, for example, Nabi Adam had an attachment to his sons. 
Nabi Nuh had an attachment to his sons. Nabi Yaqub had an attachment to his sons. Nabi Musa had an attachment to his daughters. You find therefore that virtually every prophet in the Quran, Allah gives us a general analysis of their attachment to their sons. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the avenue for us to understand that sometimes in our life, our sons and our daughters may be a zina for us, an adornment. But sometimes in our life, our sons and our daughters may be a fitna for us. Isn't it? You find for example in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one verse says, Al-mal wal banoon zina al hayat al dunya. Your wealth and your children are the zina of this world. They are the decoration, the adornment. In another verse, Allah says, Innama amwalakum wa awladakum fitna. Sometimes no, sometimes your children are the biggest test that you face in this world. And that's why you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested every great personality through the responsibility of having children. As in you find that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The Holy Prophet himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that even he would be tested with his children. And the fact that the Holy Prophet lost his sons when they were babies, as in you could say that they were infants, not older than a year and a half, let's say, and Rasulullah lost his sons. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced his sons with a daughter. Therefore you find when you examine the story of Prophet Ibrahim and the sacrifice of Ismail, it opens the avenues for us to reflect on our relationship with our own sons. Or with our own daughters. Have we recognized how blessed we are with them or not? Are we so attached to them that we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? Have we maintained our discipline with them in their upbringing or not? This particular incident allows us to reflect on our own relationships with our sons or our daughters within our own houses. Therefore, let's examine this incident and seek to understand what exactly are the lessons to be learned in the following stages. Number one, why does God put the human through such tests when God knows the unseen and the seen? Number two, was this the first test of Ibrahim with his, with his child? Or did he face a test 13 years before this one? Number three, when Ibrahim saw a dream, what is the position of dreams in the religion of Islam? Number four, and of the utmost importance, why did Rasulullah say, I am the son of the two sacrifices? Which two sacrifices? And number five, how did Imam al Hussein have to face a sacrifice within his own life? And which child did he sacrifice on the 10th of Muharram? Let's examine this and dissect this topic in depth. Whenever you discuss the sacrifice of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, the first issue that always emerges is why does God put us through tests? As in many times people ask this question, that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the seen and the unseen, He knows the hidden and He knows the apparent, why then does Allah put us through tests? What does Allah gain from putting us through tests? As in when you look in the world today, You'll find many families are tested with their children. You'll find many families are tested with their wealth, with their health, with their education. And many people always turn around and say, Ya Allah, why? Why me? At the end of the day, you are the all-powerful. What do you gain from testing? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the religion of Islam, in our theology, Allah does not gain anything himself from testing us. Rather, Allah gives us tests for our own benefit. What do I mean? I mean, if you look at life generally, every stage in your development and your growth as a human being requires a test. If you put it on the most trivial level, I go to school. For me to graduate from school, I've got to go through a test, isn't it? Then I go to college. For me to graduate from college, I have to go through tests. I go to university. For me to go to university, I have to go through tests. I get to a workplace. For me to grow, for a grow from a trainee to a CEO, I have to go through tests, isn't it? You find in our workplace, in our life, our growth comes through these tests. You'll never find anyone saying to a college or a school or university, why are you testing my children? Never. Parents love tests, don't they? As in when it's exam week, have you seen the thrill on a parent's face in exam week? 
You find that they love it when we go through these tests. Why? Do the parents turn around and say, you know what? Why do these schools test my children? My children will not sit these tests. No. You revise for those tests and you get the best marks. Why? Because our parents knew that these tests were for our benefit. That we have everything theory. The test makes it practical. Isn't it? As many concepts, I have a theory in my head. Mathematics, I've done all the revision. Science, I've done all the revision. English literature and history, I've done all the revision. A test makes what's theory become practical. All of that that I've memorized, when the exam paper comes, how many of you have faced an exam paper where you've memorized for six weeks? The moment you see the paper, there's two reactions. There's those who see it and are thinking, I've not done any revision. And then there are those who see it and say, I can't wait to face this test. Bring on the questions. My memory is going to take the theory into practical. Our life is dictated by going through tests to make us grow. Likewise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this to be the actual meaning of our life spiritually. That when Allah puts us through a test, the first reason is what? To actualize the potential within our souls. What do we mean? When Allah told Ibrahim to perform this act, do you think it was a test of Ibrahim's obedience? No. Allah had seen earlier, Ibrahim was very obedient. So, Ya Allah, why did you tell Ibrahim to go through this test? It's because I want to let Ibrahim's soul keep growing. Because this soul should never stop growing in your life. Isn't it? As in one way in which we can oppress this soul which God gave us, is by being stagnant. Why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at polytheism so low? As in sometimes people say, what's wrong with the mushrik? He has his beliefs, I have my beliefs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like shirk, not because of the person believing in that many gods. It's because the person isn't allowing his soul to grow. He's stagnant, there's no reflection on what he's worshipping. If he reflected, he would see that that which I'm worshipping is of no benefit to me whatsoever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why does he let us go through tests? Because there's a philosophy in life which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to understand. Sometimes the greatest strength you get is through adversity. Isn't it? How many times have you seen people say, I've gained strength through adversity? You say, what do you mean strength through adversity? When you go through adversity, you should be depressed. There's many who say, you know what? Many a trial made me a stronger human being. If you see someone, for example, who's lost a father, you say to them, is it the most difficult moment in your life? Some of them will say, it was difficult at the beginning, but it made me stronger. Because then I understood what responsibility meant to look after my family. Sometimes you see someone who's gone through a divorce. You say to them, it must have been hard going through a divorce. Yes, it was hard, but that adversity made me stronger next time. I became a better person next time. Sometimes in life, a trial molds a human being. A human being has certain qualities which are innate. Allah wants those qualities to emerge. How many of you, before you went through a trial, used to tell the whole world, guys, you should be patient. You know, patience is a virtue. Have sabr. When you went through something, you're like, I used to talk about patience. Now I can taste the smell of patience. Isn't it? How many of us? We talked and talked and talked. Talking about sabr is not the same as living sabr. And sometimes when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through a test, He's telling us, you know what? There are certain things inside you, you need to actually see. You need to let them grow. Therefore, the first reason Allah tests us is to allow the soul to actualize to its potential. The second reason is, of course, Allah wants to see whether our belief is only lip service or whether our belief is real. What do I mean? How many times in the Quran do you see Allah saying, do they think that they can say we believe without us testing them? At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to differentiate the believer from the disbeliever. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how does he do this? Through a test. Sometimes a person, when they are tested, they turn around and they say, you don't exist anymore. Why are you testing me like this? Sometimes there are others when they are tested, they are like, you have so much wisdom in the way you test me. When Yaqub didn't see Yusuf for that many years, do you remember the line he said? Sabran Jameel. What a lovely patience. It's as if Yaqub could have easily said, it is patience. No. He said, it's a lovely patience. Meaning what? 
Meaning that if Allah wanted to test my Iman through taking my son away from me, then it's a lovely patience for me to be tested in that way. And that's why Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. Allahumma salli alayhi wa sallam. In Nahj al-Balagha, Imam Ali has a fantastic line. He says, O mankind, do not say to Allah, Ya Allah, I seek refuge from your tests, because each and every one of you will be tested. Rather say, Ya Allah, I seek refuge from you from a test that may lead me astray. Ali ibn Abi Talib. And his mind. Ali ibn Abi Talib, his mind is a mind of a person above humanity. As in human beings are one thing, Ali ibn Abi Talib is another. Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he talks like that, what is he saying? Saying sometimes we say, Ya Allah, don't test us. No, no, no. You're all going to be tested. Say, Ya Allah, don't give me a test that may take me away from your path. How many Muslims do you see in the world today? As soon as something goes wrong, they're like, you know what? I don't even believe in God anymore. There's no such thing as God. Look what happens. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, ask Allah never to put you through a test where you end up saying words like this. Because what? Because sometimes when we go through tests, shaitan loves the whisper. Look at the test this Lord's showing you. You think he's merciful? Which mercy is this? You know that, that whispering? If your Lord loves you so much, especially when you see your mom become ill, or you see a cousin have cancer, or you see someone dying of a disease, straight away you start having those whispers. There's no such thing as God. If he was God, he'd be merciful. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, say to Allah, Ya Allah, don't show me a test where I'm going to go astray. If you're going to test me, allow it to be a test where I see the beauty of your wisdom. And I tell you, we need to read this dua because sometimes in our lives, we may go through a moment in our teens, in our 20s, in our 40s, in our 60s, just for a split second where we are like, you know what? Maybe he doesn't exist because if he did, he wouldn't do this to me. Is it? But then look at Ayyub, as soon as Allah tested him, his wife said, why has God tested us so much? Do you really believe in a Lord who tests us like this? He said to her, for 80 years, he's blessed me so much. So what if he tests me for seven? When you go through a test, ask yourself, how many blessings has he given you? And now you begin to doubt him because of one test? All those other blessings, you didn't even honor with gratefulness. And now when he tests you, you turn around and say, why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave me these eyes, which I can see with, and a mouth, which I can speak with, and hands, which I can touch. You find that Prophet Jesus said to Allah, said, Ya Allah, who's the greatest of your creation? He replied, the greatest of my creation is this lady who lives at the end of your road. Prophet Jesus, as soon as he saw this, what did Prophet Jesus say? He went towards the end of his road. Please pay attention towards this. He went towards the end of his road. When he went towards the end of his road, he saw a lady sitting down. He was wondering, why would Allah say, this lady is the greatest? He came near her, she doesn't have any hands. He came closer, she doesn't have any feet. He came closer, she doesn't have any eyes, and she can't see. Nabi Isa wondered, why would Allah say she is so grateful? He came near and said, excuse me, oh lady, I want to ask you a question. What, are you grateful for what God's given you? She goes, oh, prophet of God. When he introduced himself, she said, Oh, Prophet of God, how can I not be grateful for what God gave me? So, but you don't have feet, you don't have hands, and you can't see. She said, How can I not thank the Lord who did not give me feet that may walk towards disobeying Allah? Or hands which may touch that which is disobeying Allah? Or eyes that may look at that which is against what Allah accepts? How great is this Lord? Therefore, when Allah tests us, it's to mold us as human beings and to actualize our potential. And that's why when you come to Prophet Ibrahim السلام, when Prophet Ibrahim came to take Ismail, was this his first test? No. Prophet Ibrahim, 13 years before this incident, Prophet Ibrahim, 13 years before, Allah had already tested him with Ismail. In which way? Allah had already ordered Ibrahim to let Ismail and his mother Hajar live in a barren land called Mecca. Tell me, is it easy for you to leave your wife and your newborn baby in a land where there's no water and no vegetation? As in, do you know how difficult it must be for a father to see his son thirsty? It must be difficult 
for a father to see a baby thirsty. It's the worst feeling, as in how many fathers over here, your child, if he starts crying just for a few seconds, you ask the mother, what's wrong? Imagine you have to leave your baby in a barren land called Mecca, and you, Allah has told you, if you love me, then do it. So he left Hajar, he left Ismail in that barren land of Mecca. And as you know, much of what we see today came from that barren land. Hajar would be there. And she said, if Allah accepts us being here, then we'll be here. But Ibrahim, where do I get water from for your baby? If I don't have food, how will I produce the milk for your baby? Ibrahim, where's the vegetation? The narrations mention that Hajar went between two hillcocks, Safa and Marwa. She went from Safa and Marwa seven times until you found that the water of Zamzam gushed forth. That water of Zamzam, that whole incident, Allah had highlighted. We'd already tested Ibrahim. But in life, if I give you another test, it doesn't mean I don't like you. It means I want to see you come closer to me more. Sometimes in life, when we're given one test, we're like, okay, one test is fine. When you're tested 40 days later, someone's like, Ya Allah, what am I doing wrong? Imam al-Baqir turned this on its head. Do you know what Imam said? He said, when Allah loves you, he drowns you in the sea of suffering. You'd think Imam al-Baqir would say that the reason you're being tested is because you're a bad human. If it's because I'm a bad human, what's Ibrahim done bad in his life? Sometimes Allah loves to see you get closer to him. So what does Allah do? He gives you a second test. And that's why that second test came when Ismail was 13 years of age. Remember, the Jews and the Christians say the sacrifice is Ishaq. Ishaq wasn't alive at the time. Ishaq, you find what? As in we find that Ismail was older than Ishaq. We say that the firstborn of Abraham is Ismail, and therefore that's the sacrifice. You found that Ismail, Nabi Ibrahim sees a dream. And all of what I'm going to narrate is what gets acted and honored every year in the Hijjah. Nabi Ibrahim sees in his dream. What does he see? He sees in his dream that he has to sacrifice his son. Question, dreams have a meaning in this religion or no? Because why would Allah need to use a dream? As in, Why doesn't Allah send the angel Gabriel to say, Ibrahim, you've got to sacrifice your son. End of story and move on. No, sometimes Allah's communication methods are different. Sometimes Allah used the voice to speak to a prophet like Moses. Sometimes Allah used Jibra'il, like with our holy prophet, let's say. Sometimes Allah communicates to his creation through dreams. Someone says, all dreams have a meaning? No. Sometimes you may have a dream which Nabi Yusuf in the Quran describes as Adghath or Ahlam. Adghath, what are Adghath? Adghath, you see in the haystack? The haystack in a farm, big haystack. The stick, the sticks within the haystack are all jumbled up, aren't they? These are called Adghath. Adghath or Ahlam means what? Means you sometimes see a dream which is crazy. You sometimes in your dream, you see something which is crazy. See, for example, someone saying, yesterday I saw in my dream uh, a donkey taking me from Toronto to London. Say the person, it doesn't matter, okay, you saw this dream, doesn't mean it has a meaning. As in like, I know that dreams may have a metaphorical meaning, but no, seeing a donkey flying, and that's you possibly that night having a long night or too much food before you went to sleep. And you see that that dream goes all over the place. Then there's a second type of dream, which is what? The ulama say that the human being has 51 types of dreams. And that's why you find the ulama have a tafsir of dreams. Imam Sadiq has a book which is available today in Arabic, in Persian, and in Urdu. It's called the tafsir of dreams. It's the alphabetical order of every dream you can dream. Every dream. If you see, for example, wild cats in your dream, that means enemies in your life. If you see, for example, other things in your dream, Imam Sadiq, for everything you see in Arabic alphabet, he has defined what the dream means. You therefore find that's the second meaning. A third meaning of a dream is what? A third meaning is when Allah wants to reveal something to his prophet. For prophets, a dream is a revelation. Nabi Yusuf, in his dream, you know that dream, which Nabi Yusuf saw, the sun and the moon and everyone prostrating before him, the stars, that became revelation. The prophet, when he saw monkeys sitting on the mimbar, Bani Umayyah, when they sat on the mimbar, that was the meaning. Safiya, the wife of Rasulullah, three days before Imam al-Hussein was born. 
She came to Rasulullah, she said, Ya Rasulullah, I saw something strange in my dream and it's hurt me. I said, what is it? She said, I saw a part of your body in my lap. What does this mean? Rasulullah said, do not worry, Safiya. In three days, my grandson Hussein will be born. And that Hussein is a part of me. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. Allah loves the one who loves Hussein. Therefore, the third meaning is what? If a prophet gets a dream, it's revelation. Nabi Ibrahim sees a dream. I have to sacrifice my son. When he saw this dream first, he wasn't certain. The next day, the day of Arafah, as they would say, the day he became certain, you found Nabi Ibrahim saw this dream. He knew that I've got to take my son. The conversation between father and son is quite magnificent. Every 13 year old in this hall today, and every father in this hall, reflect on the way you talk to each other. He says to him, Qala ya bunayya. Ya bunayya, in English, can't be translated. Because English doesn't have the power of Arabic. Ya bunayya, in English, they say, Oh my dear son. Still not enough. Bunayya is a term of endearment between a father and son. Today, a father will say, Oi, come here, you. Oh, he's giving him a nickname. Hey, come here, come here. Young man. Yeah. Prophet Ibrahim taught us as a father, even though I'm a prophet, there has to be morals when we talk to our sons. Ya Bunayya, inni ara fil manami, anni adbahu. Because he had taken him, when he took him, before he even told him, he took him, he got a rope and he got a knife. He had told Hajar, I'm leaving. She accepted because she had the obedience to Allah already 13 years earlier. She had seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look after her. Go, Ismail, come with me. Ismail turned around to his dad. He said, Dad, why do you have a rope and why do you have a knife? He said, Qala ya bunayya. Oh, my dear son. Inni ara fil manami anni oh, my dear son. I see in my dream that I've got to sacrifice you. What's your opinion? Fandor, mada tara. Do you notice that the moment he says, what's your opinion, it highlights the right of your child as you engage in dialogue with them at every moment in your life. My son wants to get married to someone. Let's have dialogue. Let's discuss. My son has a problem at school. Let's discuss. My daughter wants to wear hijab. Let's discuss. As an even on the central issue of hijab. Do you know how many daughters today are thinking twice about taking off their hijab? They're thinking twice about taking it off. So what do you mean? Say today they're saying that there are many guys who are coming to propose for us, but the guys don't want a girl wearing hijab. So because they don't want a girl wearing hijab, it's better we take it off. You as a father, sit down with your daughter. Come sit down, sit down. Come with me. This guy is worth it, or Fatima al Zahra and Zainab are worth it. This guy, Wallah, he'll probably leave this earth, nobody will remember him. Let's face the facts. There are certain people, they'll die, nobody will remember them. Isn't true? Nobody. Look at him in his face. What's he done on this earth? When he asks you to take off the hijab of Zainab and Fatima, you think he's worth something? Oh Allah, look at him properly in his face. I guarantee you when he dies, only 50, 100 people will be there for him. When a person has honor of Al Muhammad, the whole world will be there for him. Therefore, he told his son, what's your opinion? Nabi Ibrahim, why are you asking a 13 year old for his opinion? He's a kid. No need to talk. No, 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 no. Because if we talk when he grows older, He'll understand why he's doing what he's doing. If however I don't talk, then the kid will be like, I want to rebel. Someone says, does that mean that if my daughter wants to wear hijab and I talk with her and she says, I'm not ready, that I should let her not wear until she's ready? No, no, no way. From the age of seven, eight or nine, that hijab has to be on. There's no such thing as when she's ready. That's got nothing to do with Islam. So what do you mean nothing to do with Islam? You are the same one who tells your daughter, before you sleep, make sure you brush your teeth, make sure you brush your teeth, make sure you brush... You care that much about her white teeth and you don't care about her modesty when she walks in front of humans. Mm -hmm. Dialogue does not mean I say to her, okay, you don't feel like it, come back to me when you do. Dialogue means I'll explain to you the greats who wore it. I'll take you to their places. Open the doors of dialogue with your children, let them understand. If I get a girl at nine and I say to her, where now? She won't understand. If from the age of seven, I introduce it. By nine, she's ready. He said that to her. The reply was what? The reply was beautiful. Oh my dear father. 
It doesn't say, oh my old man. <laughs> Today, see, it's an old man. The old man said, the old vision. Oh my dear father. Do as you've been commanded to do. There's a psychology here. When a son sees his dad being a friend to him, he loves his dad so much that when his dad is in a test, he'll say, Dad, if it makes you happy, do it. A son loves a dad who's a friend, not a dictator. When Rasulullah said, first seven years, let them free. Second seven, discipline. Third seven, be their friend. Psychologically, they will love you more if you're their friend. If you get on with them. My father, do as you've been commanded to do. Satajiduni insha'Allah min as sabirin You'll find me insha'Allah as one of the patient ones. Patient means what? Means I know that this test, my dad, isn't just good for you, it's good for me. Because if I can be patient, then Allah has pleased with me. And if you're gonna sacrifice me, then Allah has pleased with you. That's why the next verse, what did it say? Falamma aslama. They both submitted, not aslama. Falamma aslama. Both of them. Ismail put his hand out. Do you know what he said to his dad? He said to his dad, Dad, please listen to these lines. He said, Dad? He said, Yes. He said, Dad, first tie the rope around my hands and feet so you don't see me as I move. Because the worst feeling for a dad is when he sees the child move when he's hit. Isn't it? Secondly, he said, Dad, cover your eyes so you don't see me as I'm dying. Because it must be the worst feeling for a dad to see his kid dying. Look at what he's telling him. This is vital. You know where I'm heading with this. Thirdly, what do you find? Thirdly, you find that he said to him, Dad, my shirt, when you sacrifice me, take it back to mom. Because it can't be easy for my mom to know I died. History repeats itself. At that moment, before Ibrahim was going to sacrifice, Shaitan began with the whispers. Because you know, whenever you're going to make a sacrifice in your life, whenever, Shaitan's always there. What are you doing becoming religious? Whenever you become more religious, don't you notice Shaitan gets more in your way? When you're not religious, you're like, you know what, where is this guy? When you start becoming more religious, all of a sudden, Shaitan starts whispering more. Come on, what are you doing becoming religious? You're too young. Leave it. You've got a long life ahead. How many have you seen die at 70, 80? Leave it. He whispered, and that's why you found Nabi Ibrahim. What did he do? Seven times he threw the stones at Shaitan. Where are we talking about? The land of Mina, the land of Arafah, the land of Muzdalifah. Isn't it? That's where all this incident took place. He threw the stones. When he came to sacrifice his son, when the Quran said, Falamma aslama wa tallahu lil jabeen, then what? Wanadaynahu ayya Ibrahimu qad saddaqta al ru'ya. He came to sacrifice his son. As he's sacrificing, he's noticing there's nothing happening. And then he realizes that he hears the voice, qad saddaqta al ru'ya. Inna kathalika najzil muhsineen. Ibrahim, your dream has been fulfilled. This is the way we reward those who do good. Allah ransomed Ismail with a goat. And the narrations talk of a ram or a sheep. Allah ransomed Ismail. Ismail didn't get, uh, get killed. Quran says, what? And then what? With what? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did what? He ransomed that sacrifice. وَتَرَكْنَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْآخَرِينَ And we let that sacrifice be left for one of Ibrahim's descendants. That sacrifice would be left for later on. Here you find what? Because of those actions of Nabi Ibrahim, we have today an institution by the name of Hajj. Hajj, when all the Muslims go, all these Muslims go to honor who? To honor Ibrahim's sacrifice of Ismail. But there's a problem. Today, when many Muslims are going to Hajj, they're not finding the spiritual change. 
How many people when they go to Hajj, you will find some say, I understood Hajj properly. You'll find others say, you know what, it was so hectic, I don't feel I've changed. Why? Because they didn't see the spiritual lessons from Ibrahim and Ismail. What do I mean? When Nabi Ibrahim came with his act, there was a spiritual lesson behind each act. When there was a spiritual lesson, it was for us. Let's look at some of these spiritual lessons. For example, one of the places you go in Hajj to honor Nabi Ibrahim is Arafah, isn't it? You go to Mount Arafah where Nabi Ibrahim was. You are meant to be at Mount Arafah from Dhuhr until Maghrib. Some of us will be there and we're like, okay, okay, okay. I have to be there from midday until Maghrib. But the spiritual ones of us realize that why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make me go to Arafah at Dhuhr time? Dhuhr means the midday of our life. Midday. Allah was telling us, this is the midday of your life. You've spent half of it. How are you going to spend the other half? Spiritual effect. Hajj wasn't just meant to be me at Arafah. Dhuhr, Maghrib. Yes, is it Maghrib? Let's go to Muzdalifa. No. I'm at the Dhuhr of my life. How will I spend the rest of my life now? Do you know what Arafah, when you sit down, do you know what our sixth Imam says? Whoever sits at Arafah, and doubts that Allah has forgiven every sin he's ever committed, his hajj is incomplete. What a merciful Lord. I, who's been insignificant, I, who's gone against your commands, if I sit at a place for six hours, you forgive each of my sins that I committed. And if I doubt you've forgiven them, my hajj is not complete. And they say the Lord of Islam is a Lord who's always angry. This Lord is angry? Who tells us come to Arafah? Then when you go to Muzdalifah, many people go to Muzdalifah, they sit around the litter, they see dirt everywhere and they start complaining. No. When you go to Muzdalifah, the word is dilaf, nearness. And in Muzdalifah, you've got to be there under the darkness of the night, isn't it? Because when you look at the darkness of the night, you realize, Ya Allah, I'm leaving the darkness of my life to come to the light of your religion. <laughs> then when I go to pick up those pebbles, I'm going towards shaitan. You'll find many people, honestly, when they come towards shaitan, You'll find them saying, you know what, when I throw the pebble at shaitan, does it have to go to the top right hand corner, the top left hand corner, or the bottom, or do I flick it, or do I throw it? No. The spiritual aspect of why I pick up those stones, is each stone represents a sin. I'm now getting rid of that sin. Envy, let me throw it out. Arrogance, let me throw it out. Stubbornness, let me throw it out. Hypocrisy, lust, gluttony. Let me throw them out of my life. Sometimes you'll find people who pick up a pebble, they throw it, but they're not throwing sins out of their life. When I throw them out, I'm saying never in my life will they come back to me. Then when you come to sacrifice, Ibrahim sacrificed Ismail, didn't he? What's your sacrifice? Each one of us. What's our sacrifice? What's our Ismail? In the month of Muharram, those of us who, for example, owe people money, our Ismail is to give the money back. That's our sacrifice, isn't it? Those of us who've been rude to our parents, our sacrifice is to be good with them. Those of us who don't wear hijab, our Ismail is our hijab. Those of us who listen to the music of the musicians, our Ismail is to stop listening to music. Each of us has an Ismail, isn't it? Ibrahim's Ismail was his son. What's your Ismail? These were the spiritual messages of that journey. It wasn't just a case of a man killing his son. It was a case of a man teaching us that this religion was a religion which takes your soul to the highest levels. This religion, every part of its meaning is to enliven the soul, is to bring four million people together at one place and enliven them. And that's why you find Rasulullah many times would say, I am the son of the two sacrifices. 
People say, Ya Rasulullah, what do you mean two sacrifices? He said, Ismail and my father Abdullah. Abdul Muttalib, Rasulullah's grandfather, had how many sons? He had only one son at the beginning of his life. When he caught buried treasure in the bottom of the ground, those of you who've heard my Khums lecture from two years ago would know about this analysis of the Khums of Abdul Muttalib and how it spread. The Khums was buried in the ground, Abdul Muttalib found the Khums. The Quraysh started showing envy to him. He only had one son. He said, Ya Allah, I make a vow. If you give me 10 sons to defend me, I promise, Ya Allah, I'll sacrifice one of them. It's a nidr. In Islam, we have a nidr, a vow. So he said, Ya Allah, if you give me 10 sons, I'll sacrifice. Allah gave him 12 sons and 6 daughters. Rasulullah had 12 uncles and 6 aunties. Of those uncles, you know them, Abu Talib and Hamza and Abbas and so on. When Abdul Muttalib had to choose a son who's going to sacrifice, he cast lots. Abdullah's name came out, Rasulullah's dad. He said, come with me, my son. I have to sacrifice you for the path of Allah. Abdullah said, oh, my father, do as you've been commanded. You see how history comes back. Do as you've been commanded. The daughters of Abdul Muttalib, the aunties of Rasulullah, were crying, Dad, please, please, please. He said, look, I'm going to cast a lot. Either Abdullah has to be sacrificed or ten camels. He cast a lot, said Abdullah, he said, I'm going to sacrifice him. Dad, please, even if it means more camels, please cast lots. He saw his daughters crying, cast another lot, Abdullah versus twenty camels. Abdullah versus 30 camels, Abdullah, 40 camels, Abdullah, 50, Abdullah keeps coming out. Until it got to 100 camels, the 100 camels came out. His daughter said, Alhamdulillah, that means we don't have to sacrifice Abdullah. I said, no, just because one lot came out in the way of the camels, I've had 10 coming out in the way of Abdullah. At that moment, he said, I'll do another three lots. The other three lots continued on the camels. He ended up sacrificing camels in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of Abdullah. Therefore, Rasulullah would say, I am the son of the two sacrifices. And that's why you found that that sacrifice of Ibrahim, Allah said clearly in the Quran. He said, We ransomed that sacrifice. Ismail didn't happen. But we left the sacrifice to happen in one of Ibrahim's descendants. Rasulullah is a descendant of Nabi Ibrahim, isn't he? He's from the line of Ismail. It's a shame our Christian and Jewish brethren focus on the line of Isaac but forgot the line of Ishmael. In the line of Ismail, Abdullah, was he the sacrifice? No, camels were sacrificed at the end. So who was the sacrifice? The sacrifice was Abi Abdullah. And you find that's why in Ziyarat Warith we say, Assalamu alayka ya Waritha Ibrahim Khalilallah. Salams to you who is the inheritor of Ibrahim, the friend of Allah. And that's why Iqbal, Iqbal picked on this poetry brilliantly. Iqbal made a phenomenal combination and connection between Ismail and Hussein. Iqbal in his poetry would say, Ismail helped build the Kaaba. Hussein made sure that the dignity of the Kaaba remained. Subhanallah. This Iqbal, his mind is a mind of a genius. Ismail helped his dad build the Kaaba, isn't it? Maqam Ibrahim and so on. Said, whereas Aba Abdullah kept the dignity of the Kaaba alive. Ismail was the embodiment of love for Allah when he was willing to be sacrificed. Aba Abdullah was willing to not just sacrifice himself, sacrifice his whole family. That's why Charles Dickens would say that if Hussein went out for worldly desires, I don't understand why he'd take his family. A man would only take his family if he went out to please God. Isn't it? And all those family members that on a night like this, 
We remember all those family members of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. And you know what did Nabi Ismail say to Nabi Ibrahim? Dad, blindfold at first, Dad, tie your hands and your feet so you don't see me move when I'm killed. A dad, it kills him to see his son die, let alone see his son move his hands when he's hit. Dad number two, please blindfold so you don't see me when I'm struck. Number three, dad, take my shirt back to my mom because it must be difficult for my mom to know I've died. Ya Aba Abdullah. On the 10th of Muharram, when you took the six-month-old baby out, did you look at that baby and think it would flap its hands the way it did? Ya Aba Abdullah, you never had a blindfold on. How did you bear to see the six-month-old baby? Ya Aba Abdullah, how hard was it to tell Rabab? How hard was it to tell Rabab? And that's why on the 10th of Muharram, I tell you, Abi Abdullah on the 10th of Muharram, that sacrifice, he kept the message of Ibrahim alive. And you know, it was his auntie Zain, it was Zainab who brought the six month old baby to Imam Al Hussein. Zainab, do you know why Rabab didn't? Rabab never had energy to look at her baby anymore. Look at this baby. This baby is coming to me, brothers and sisters. Look at this baby right in front of me. Imagine a baby like this. Just imagine. And look at the way I'm tender when I hold this baby. I've never seen an arrow pierce a baby's neck. Mothers, mothers, how many of you, if your baby cries a little, you'll move. Mothers, if you don't hear your baby move, don't you then feel that the baby may be dying? If you don't hear your baby groan or moan, don't you think there's a problem? Imagine Rabab told Zainab, I can't take the baby to him. And Zainab looked at Rabab, she said, why? She said, I can't even hear any noises coming out of the baby anymore. There's no sound. There's nothing. Brothers and sisters, imagine Abba Abdullah came to carry a baby like this out. Zainab bought that baby, Imam al Hussein looked at the baby and then he looked at the army of Umar bin Sa'ad and he said, oh army of Umar bin Sa'ad, am I a sinner or is the baby a sinner? If you say I'm a sinner, the baby can't be a sinner. So give the baby some water of army of Umar bin Sa'ad. And that army of Umar bin Sa'ad, some narrations mention, some of them said to Umar bin Sa'ad, just give him water, it's a baby for goodness sake, give him water. And Umar bin Sa'ad said, never, I want to see Hussein break apart. Then do you know what Imam Hussein did? He took this baby and he went to the middle of Karbala. When Ismail touched the earth, Zamzam came out. Whereas the six month old baby touched the ground and there was no water. Imam Hussein said, I'm going to leave the baby here in the middle of the ground. I'm not going to come near any of you. One of you come out, I beg you give the baby water. I promise the baby we can't hear him. They left, nobody came near the baby. Until the third time, Imam went and picked up the baby. When he went to pick up the baby, Imam as soon as he picked up the baby, what did he do? Imam came back, he looked towards the opposition, he said, now I beg all of you. Now I beg all of you. Hear the tears of this baby. And remember the tears of the baby on the 10th of Muharram. Hear the tears. And how hard is it for me now to carry a baby who's crying, let alone Abi Abdullah, it's his son. And that's why Abu Abdullah, he looked towards the army of Umar bin Sa'ad, he begged them, again there was no response. Do you know who describes the death of this baby the best? Mukhtar. Mukhtar said, I caught Harmala after Karbala. And he said, I looked at Harmala bin Kahil. I said, Harmala on the 10th of Muharram, how many arrows did you shoot? He said, I shot seven arrows towards the army of Hussein. He, Mukhtar looked at him and said, Harmala, how many of them shot their target? He said, four shot and three missed. 
He said to him at that moment, he said, Harmala, the four that shot their targets, who did you shoot? <laughs> he looked at him. He said to him, O oh, Mukhtar, the first arrow that I shot, I shot it on the right eye of Abu Fadl al-Abbas when he was sitting on his horse. <clears throat> MashaAllah. I shot the arrow into the eyes of Abu Fadl al-Abbas. He said to him, O oh, Mukhtar, normally when a man, when a man falls from his horse, he falls with his hands in front of him. But I saw Abbas fall without any hands in front of him. Look at this baby, but the baby has drank water. He said to him, Oh Harmala, the second arrow. He said, the second arrow I shot on the chest of the nephew of Imam al Hussein. He said, Hussein was lying on the ground on the 10th of Muharram, arrows surrounding his body. Omar bin Sa'ad said to me, Oh Hanumala, shoot the chest of Abi Abdullah. He said, just before I was about to shoot him, a young man ran out from the tent. He said, I don't allow you to shoot my uncle while I'm alive, while I'm alive. <laughs> so we shot this young man and he, when we shot him, he turned around to his uncle and he said, Oh my uncle Abi Abdullah, I couldn't bear to see you alone on the ground with no one to help you. Now the line, he said to him, Oh Harmala, how about the third arrow that you shot? <laughs> Listen to the reply. He said, the third arrow that I shot is the arrow that hurts me the most. He said to him, Oh Harmala, the third arrow, who did you shoot? He said to him, Oh Mukhtar, the third arrow. I struck on the six month old baby of Abdullah. <laughs> he said to him, I used an arrow that I normally use to cut the neck of a camel. <laughs> he said to him, Oh Mukhtar, listen to the lies. He said to him, Oh Mukhtar, when I shot the baby, I saw the baby flap its hands like a bird flaps its wings. <laughs> ya Allah, imagine the baby flapping. <laughs> oh Mukhtar, I saw the baby flap its hands like a bird flaps its wings. <laughs> Mukhtar then looked at him, he said, how about the fourth arrow? He said, the fourth arrow I shot on the chest of Abi Abdullah when he lay on the ground. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, you know when Imam al-Hussein, when the baby died in his hands, Imam al-Hussein walked towards his tent and he came back and he walked and he came back and he walked and he came back. He did this seven times. Someone called out, Abba Abdullah, what's wrong with you? Why do you walk back and come forth? He said to them, I do not know how to tell a mother that there's an arrow in her baby's neck. <laughs> That's why brothers and sisters on the night of the 11th of Muharram, Rabab went out into the middle of the battlefield in Karmana, in Karmana. <laughs> Saying as Zainab called out, Rabab, 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 where are you? She turned around and she said, Oh Zainab, I'm looking for my baby. I have something to give my baby now. I want to find my baby. And that's why one of the poets says when Rabab returned to Karbala on the Arba'een, she came to the grave of the baby. <laughs> brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, you see Imam Zain al Abideen? Look at this baby, brothers and sisters. You see Imam Zain al Abideen when he came to Karbala in the Arba'een. He came to bury his father, Abi Abdullah. 
Because he came to return the head of his father to his body. Do you know when he came to the body of his father, as he was ret he returned the head, Imam Zain al Abidin narrates, I heard the voice from the body of my father, Abi Abdullah. I heard a voice call out, O oh, Zain al Abidin, put the six month old baby on my chest when you bury me. <laughs> Why, O oh, Hussein? Why? O oh, Zain al Abidin, put the six month old baby on my chest. O oh, Zain al Abidin, I promise you the hurt, of the hurt and the heat of the arrow still burns me now. <laughs> One of the poets says, when Rabab came to the grave, she looked at the grave and she said, O oh, grave of my baby, I beg you don't sting my baby's body with your dust. <laughs> O oh, grave of my baby, I beg you, I beg you, protect my baby's body within you. Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'oon. May Allah bless your tears tomorrow. Tomorrow, inshallah, as you know, is the day of Ashura. We will have a majlis as you know early morning and there will be a majlis in the evening and inshallah the day after tomorrow will be the final majlis here we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Abi Abdullah al Hussein to allow us to sacrifice in the way Nabi Ibrahim was willing to sacrifice his son and the way Abi Abdullah sacrificed his baby we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allow us to be amongst the companions of Imam Sahib Al Asri wa Zaman. Allow us to be amongst those who follow his message for the originators of this majlis and for all the volunteers. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise them with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the name of this holy night, the night of Ashura, the night of the 10th of Muharram. We pray to Allah that next year we're in Karbala next to the grave of Abi Abdullah and next to the grave of Abu Fadl al-Abbas and next to the grave of the martyrs of the 10th of Muharram. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a surah al-Fatiha but before it the loudest of your salawat. Of the holy house, so now I claim emulating their example, our aim. Lovers of the holy house, so now I claim emulating their example, our aim. Living like Ali and struggling like Hussein is the key if paradise we wish to gain. See the pain, see the pain, see the pain.